Good morning, I'm Pastor Steve. This is Grove Church. Uh, not the, the building bef behind me is where Grove Church meets in person, but this is Grove Church is this community that you are taking part of in the next 45 minutes. We're glad you're here. We're gonna be starting a new book of the Bible, the Gospel of John, so it's a great time to jump on board uh, with us as we're gonna look at the Christmas story through a little bit different lens. Uh, speaking of Christmas, Christmas Eve, we'll be having in-person service here at 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Come early around 4.30 so that you can uh, partake some cocoa and some other things as well. That would be uh, an invitation to you. So thank you so much. Welcome to Grove Church. family, we're excited to light the Advent candles with you. Every year we light candles as we prepare for the coming of Christ. More and more candles, more and more light as we watch and wait for Jesus to the light of the world. God of promise, come into our darkness. Renew your hope, your peace, your joy and your love in us. For you alone bring life out of death. Receive God's promise of love from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and give them drink from the river of your delights. Yes, it's the fourth Sunday of Advent, we're approaching Christmas. And as we prepare our homes, uh, prepare the tree, prepare our schedules for Christmas, let us prepare our hearts. And we're gonna do that now in a time of confession. I'm gonna uh, start us off by reading a portion of Isaiah 55 and leave some space for you to pray and seek God to prepare your hearts for forgiveness and restoration. Isaiah 55, six through seven says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on them. And to our God, he will, for he will freely pardon. Let us seek God's pardon and restoration in this moment of silence as we call out in prayer. Hear this promise of God's forgiveness from Isaiah. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the seed and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Thanks be to God. 
As God has given us peace through his, through his forgiveness and restoration, may you experience God's peace and forgiveness where you're at. The peace of Christ be with you at home and also with you. So in the comments, because we're a community, let us share signs of Christ's peace, his restoration, his forgiveness, his welcome, his embrace. Right? If the, the trees uh, and the mountains will respond, let us respond. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Peace be with you. Now will the children come as we have a special message for them downstairs. Oh, hey kids. It's Pastor Steve. Sorry, I got caught up. I, actually, can you guess what I was doing right when you showed up? No peeking. Do you think I was building something with a hammer and nails? Do you think I was taking a nap? You think I was painting? Ha. Huh. You guys are a smart group. Well, today's story, it's Christmas time. Can you believe Christmas is like less than a week away? Are you excited? Well, Christmas is the story about the birth of Jesus, right? Jesus came into this world as a baby. But what do you think he was doing right before? Before he was born. Before you were born, you were just in your mama's belly, right? Not much before that. But... Jesus is different because Jesus is God. We're reading the book of John. Actually, we're going to be reading it for a long time. So it's a good, if you're a reader, maybe you want to start reading that at home. So the book of John, John uh, is a man who loved Jesus and he wrote Jesus' story. And he starts it by saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And who is this word? It's Jesus. So Jesus, before he was born, this is kind of very different because Jesus is God. It's very different than you or me. Before Jesus was born, he was with God and he was God. And it says, all things were made by him. So Jesus, before he was born, he helped make all the earth and all the world and helped make you and me. Right? So, so when we think of baby Jesus, we have to remember that Jesus didn't just was born like you or me. He was born like you or me, but before he was born, he was still God. He was doing God things. He was helping people. He was showing God's love. He helped make the world. He he was around before he was born. You and me, we just kind of showed up uh, with, with our families, but Jesus was there since the beginning. Jesus has no beginning. Before everything was, Jesus was. And that's what makes it so amazing that we celebrate Christmas, that Jesus came as a baby. Because he was around before that. Because he's God. And he's God's son. So as we think of Christmas, and I'm going to talk about this more uh, with the, when the grown-ups come back. Uh, think about how amazing it was that Jesus is God. That Jesus always was God and always will be God. So as you think of Christmas, as you open presents, as you uh, spend time around the tree or with family and loved ones, remember that Jesus came as a baby, but Jesus is God. So he always was, and he always will be. Let us pray. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are an amazing God, that you are just like us, and that you came, came a baby like us. But also, you are always God, so you are amazing, and you are better than the best, and you are more loving than love itself. Thank you for being so amazing, so good to us, and for coming us to show us the way to live and to love and to be your forever friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let us worship this God who has no beginning and no end. Let us sing together. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Gloria, in 
from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 1 through 18. Listen to these words from the book that we love. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one who I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have received grace and peace. And grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The word of the Lord. Let us pray for God to illumine this word in our hearts. God, you are the word. 
So Lord, as we reflect on the written word, we pray, God, that we may encounter the living word. We may encounter you and know you and be in awe of you. Shine your light on our path now and always. Amen. This is a beautiful passage of scripture. For those who are Christians, you've heard these words before. If this is new to you, it's kind of, uh, there's a lot going on. But we're going to kind of spend most of our focused time on verse 14, where uh, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. As you know, there's four Gospels, four tellings of the life and ministry of Jesus. And John's Gospel, sometimes called the fourth Gospel, uh, this is the beginning. It doesn't kind of fit with uh, our nativity scene in our minds. Uh, right? And the ones that you have under the tree are the one we have displayed in the church. There's no manger in the Gospel of John. Uh, early at this point, there's no mention of Mary. There's no little town of Bethlehem. There's actually no baby that has been covered earlier in the other Gospels, but we're reminded of who that infant was. Jesus here is the pre-existent Word of God. The Word, it says, in the beginning, is reminding us of Genesis, how God created the world through His Word, through which all creation was made. And while Christmas nativities remind us that Jesus came as a baby, the only begotten Son of God did not start there, as I told our kids earlier. He's a pre-existent member of the Trinity. Before the first humans cradled their infants, Jesus was with God and was God. Right? If we all jump and, and celebrate, and then, you know, we have a nativity scene with a baby in my home as well, but if we only focused on the baby, we miss the miracle that goes beyond the virgin birth that goes beyond a couple looking for shelter so they could welcome life into the world. This prologue to this gospel reminds us that our Bibles don't start in the New Testament, that God's plan was working way beyond, even before the prophets, that God has been work for millennia. While the birth of Jesus was amazing 2,000 years ago, Jesus had been at work and active in his creation long, long before that. The baby in the manger was not the start of Jesus' story. For those familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, the, when we see the word, word, it echoes uh, the prophetic books we read recently. When we said, the word of the Lord came to this prophet or that prophet. Right? We have the picture of word, we have that picture of the word of creation and Genesis. And for the other audience, this New Testament's written in Greek, so a lot of Greek, or what they call Hellenists, read this. And when they saw the word word, logos, in their own tongue, and written it here in the original uh, manuscript, they had these philosophical ideas of what word was and uh, what it means to know the logos, to know the word, to hear the word. But these images in the Hellenistic Greek culture or the Hebraic images of the word of the Lord would have a hard time finding a place in our familiar Christmas story. Because how do we wrap our minds around uh, the Son of God who uh, identifies and presents himself as the word? How do we wrap our mind of this member of the Trinity, this person of the Trinity that preexisted and came as a baby? in the sanctuary uh, during our in-person service, and maybe in your own home, we give uh, the kids sketchbooks so they could kind of uh, digest and think about what's being said here. And I would be curious to see what are some of the drawings that come about from this? What are some of the, the works of Play-Doh, if you were to reenact the scripture in Play-Doh or Lego or whatever your preferred artistic medium is? Because it's, it's a different picture of Jesus that we may feel comfortable or familiar with. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. The pre-existent creator of the world became flesh. Just chew on that for a moment. Right? 
That's, that's uh, this fourth gospel's version of the Christmas story. Right? It's other places say a baby was born and placed in a manger. And here he says the word became flesh. That's what theologians call the incarnation, the becoming of flesh. God's ways are above our ways. So how do we wrap our minds around a word that was present in the beginning? Right? How, how can we kind of come to grips with God being uh, coming as a pre-existing cosmic word in creation and then coming forth in flesh? We can't. We can't. We're, we're limited by that. So God comes to us. That's what him becoming flesh is part of that. It's part of God approaching us, meeting us where we're at. The one who was with God and who was God becomes a man, becomes flesh and blood. The incomprehensible becomes comprehensible and explained in the person of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of theology in these verses, right? Some of you, uh, this is new concepts, new ideas, never really thought about it this way. But we are learning so much about the nature of God in this introduction to the Gospel of John. God wants to be known, right? Think of this is the great, this is the, this great introduction or affirmation of who God is, this incarnation, this becoming flesh. God wants to be known. He made his dwelling among us. Eugene Peterson has a popular paraphrase of scripture called the message. And he says, the way he paraphrases this, he says, he moved into the neighborhood. That God moved into the neighborhood, that he made his dwelling among us. One of the things about living here where I live in Hudson County is that there's familiar faces. Right? There's kind of a rhythm uh, of, of neighbors and neighborhood. When I walk down Bergen Line, I recognize the butcher from the supermarket. He doesn't know me, but I know him even when he's not wearing his, his apron and his name tag. Um, normally, I, for some reason, I come across him on 47th Street. Maybe that's on the way to uh, his home. A couple days ago, I was prayer walking uh, around here, and I saw a familiar grove face that was uh, driving along Kennedy Boulevard in her minivan, and I waved and she waved, right? There's familiarity. That same day, 20 minutes later, I was on Bergen Line. I'm on my way back home. And there I saw George, a neighbor who lives right across the street from our church building, a familiar face. I could end up singing that Sesame Street classic, Who Are the People in Your Neighborhood?, Right? Because as you are known and know the people on the street, there's people in your coffee shop maybe that might know you and might know your order or your favorite diner. When you guys come in, they know what to expect and maybe you have your waitress that knows you. There's 90,000 people in a mile radius from here. But there's still familiar faces from just being and dwelling in this neighborhood for, for me it's been nine years. There's still familiar faces even though there's so many people around here. It's something about living and dwelling and working among the people. That's what Jesus did. God knows us and makes himself known to us. He experienced the joys and the sorrows of humanity from every vantage point and demonstrates for us what true humanity is like. Not keeping socially distant from humanity, but entering our close personal space. Jesus goes and lives and works and ministers. God himself comes in the flesh. I've had teacher friends in the past that when we went out to dinner or did different activities, they requested to be uh, out of their jurisdiction of where they teach because uh, they, they don't want to be seen as the teacher uh, you know, all the time. They wanted a little break, a little reprieve on the weekends and their time off. right? And, and they want to eat a meal or go to the movies in obscurity. Uh, but the opposite is true with Jesus. Right? The opposite is true with God. God went out of his way in miraculous form and function, that great sacrifice, to be known, to be made known. In love, he came uh, bearing arms that can embrace and that later hung on the cross. Jesus came in the flesh with a mouth that could proclaim the good news of his Father in heaven. And the same mouth that could sit at the table, talk with his friends, and receive a meal in hospitality. 
a God who is so big but made himself small and vulnerable so we can know him and experience the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. God became flesh and dwelled among us. As the scripture has that phrase, uh, there's echoes of a greater Old Testament story. Literally it means he made a dwelling, that he, he pitched a tent. It could be translated as pitched a tent or tabernacled, some versions have. Like the tabernacle that Moses uh, had in his time period in the wilderness, where the presence of God was there, was present with him as they traveled around. This tent setup is something that those who are Jewish would read into it. They would hear the tabernacle and remember the story of their ancestors. And this is what this picture of Jesus walking around, it's God pitching a tent in your neighborhood. It's God coming and dwelling among the people. Not far away, not distant, not a place where you have to commute to, but right there in your midst. The location of God would not be anchored in a temple or in a distant city, but instead would be united in the presence of Jesus, who was and walked among the people. This is a miracle that we could easily take for granted because it's kind of familiar. God, the most amazing, powerful, holy, infinite being, drew near to his creation. God draws near to us crossing every barrier or obstacle that separates our fallen humanity from experiencing him. And that was part of what the life of ministry was about, making God known and making God knowable, helping people then and now experience and encounter a God whose ways are higher than our ways, whose mind is incomprehensible. Verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus has explained God to us. So we can know the unknowable. So we can see the one whose glory blinds us. If you want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. If we want to know what the will of God is like, We can look at Jesus. We want, if we want to know what love, the love of God is like, we can look at Jesus. We want to know what God's priorities are. We can look at Jesus. We have been given God's Son, Jesus Christ. And that's when we want to explain God to our family and our friends and to our children. How can we explain this incomprehensible God? We can show them Jesus. And we point them to the scriptures because that is where we find the clearest pictures of our Lord and Savior. Do you realize how little we know? And I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking about humankind. I found out recently there's a, a list of unsolved math problems. Like the best mathematicians in the world don't know if there's any odd perfect numbers exist. I know scientists don't even know the inner working of our planet. We've only uh, dug a couple miles into the crust. So we don't know how the magnetic field is conducted on the planet that we live on. And on the ocean, we've only explored 5% of the oceans. That means 95% of the oceans, which make up so much of our planet, have been explored. We don't really know what's on most of the ocean floors. We know so little about creation. Our arms are too short. Our minds are too finite for us to fully understand God, the creator. God came in the flesh and came to us so that we can know him, so we can experience him. And he came and lived in a way that he experienced everything we would. The struggles that break our heart, the hunger, the rejection, the pain, the betrayal. God experienced it in Jesus. Five years ago, a Gulf War veteran uh, who also served as a district court judge, his name is Lou Oliveira, he sentenced a Green Beret to a day in jail because the former, as a former Green Beret, because the Green Beret violated his probation for a DWI. So the judge drove the former soldier to jail, 
and began to become concerned about uh, PTSD that the soldier would experience because he experienced some horrible, horrific things in the war. So to the Green Beret's surprise, as soon as the Green Beret entered the jail cell, the judge was there. And the judge entered the cell. The doors were closed. And the whole day, the whole time, the judge was there so that the Green Beret would not have to spend any time alone in jail. He accompanied him the entire time. They, there was a one-person cell. They sat on the bunk together. The soldier was never alone while he served his sentence. It's hard to imagine a judge that would take off his robe and voluntarily spend 24 hours behind bars to sit with a man that he had sentenced. To leave a comfy home, to sit in a bunk with a prisoner all night long. It's hard to imagine that our creator, our creator came and left the glories of heaven to be with us, not only for a night, but the perfect God came the amazing distance of heaven and earth so you and I can become children of God so that we would never be alone. God visited us in our cell. The miracle of the incarnation is the miracle that a transcendent God not only can be known, which is amazing in itself, but he went a sacrificial distance to be made known and wants to be made known. God came to us, the word of God who existed with God and who is God came to earth as a baby, humble, to show his love and to rescue us that we may be children of God. So in, this middle, so in the middle of this busy season of gifts and tinsel, let us embrace this miracle of Christmas, that Jesus is near, that the one who was with God and is God became flesh, to dwell in our neighborhood because God loves us, because God is rescuing us, because God wants to be known and knows that we can't do it on our own. God calls us, rescues us, and makes us children of God, something that we couldn't do without him. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are good. Lord, it's hard for us to fully hold your glory, your power, and your might, and the humility in which you showed up in a manger 2,000 years ago. Lord, help us to not lose the miracle of how amazing you are, of how powerful you are, of how eternal you are. We thank you, Lord, that you humbled yourself so that we could know you, so that we could trust you and love you. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. Lord, we pray for those who this season is a time of challenge. We pray for those uh, who recognize our losses and are unsatisfied with their relationships, O oh God, in this season of celebrations. We pray for those who struggle to find reason to celebrate, those who are alone, are hungry, those without uh, sustaining relationships. Lord, we pray for our country, those who are still, still homeless, Lord, after those tornadoes, those who are grieving the losses that they've had. Lord, we pray that you be their help. Lord, we pray that we may also go into the neighborhood, that we may dwell and live and love and embrace those that you have put in our community, that we be signposts, that we be proclaimers of good news. Lord, we pray for Grove Church, that in this busy season, we may be faithful to you. Be with those that are online and their households. We thank you, God. 
And Lord, together we pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debtors, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We appreciate you being with us this time. We know there's a lot of other places to go, but we think this is important. Uh, it's a busy time of year, but let us uh, embrace this mystery of God coming in Jesus. So welcome. We're so glad that you've been with us this time. Uh, also, want to thank those who have given financially. If this is your faith community, we appreciate for you to partner with what God is doing here and participate. And you could do that through prayer. You could do that giving. Uh, you could do that in many ways hands-on. So if you're looking to give or not sure where to give, you, we receive uh, donations via the mail. And of course, our website, you could go there and give as well. Also, I want to invite you to come on person on Christmas Eve. It's great to worship at home, but there's something special about hearing the voices of others as we sing Christmas carols and relive and uh, refresh that Christmas story. So we'll be here at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary, ending in candlelight, but come early, like 4.30ish, for hot cocoa right outside in this beautiful area. All right, in a few moments, we're gonna have John Pecorelli with our closing song, and then there's some reflection questions as we uh, think and kind of chew upon this first section of the Gospel of John. But where you are right now, uh, bow your heads and receive this blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, right now and always. Say 
Jesus Christ is born. 